Hello everyone and welcome here at uh, Cloud9, Tivoli Vredenburg. Welcome to uh, Studium Generale, the platform for knowledge and reflection of the Utrecht University. Uh, my name is Laura Mol, I work for uh, Studium Generale and I'm so happy that you're all here for uh, the Science Cafe on car addiction. Also a warm welcome to everyone who is at home, in the comfort of their own home, uh, watching this live. Um, yeah, I just want to start off, like, who is, uh, for whom is it the first time at the Studium Generale event? Oh, quite an, ah, so good to see. Hello, hello. Well, so uh, for you who don't uh, really know us, we organize all types of events, such as well, talk shows, uh, uh, lectures. We also have a festival called Bedweten Festival. We have a Philosophy Festival, always in April of the year. Uh, currently, we're also hosting a uh, online challenge. So if you go to our website, www.sg.uu.nl, it's weird saying it in English, www.sg.uu.nl, uh, you can see uh, the challenge where you can uh, learn more about your senses. So if you want to feel inspired, you can take a look there. Uh, you can follow us on social media, YouTube, you can watch all of our uh, events live uh, with a stream or watch them back at a later time when it's convenient for you. You can also subscribe to our newsletter uh, to stay up to date. Um, yeah, we're always looking to improve our events, so at the end of this event I will show you a QR code on the screen and uh, if you uh, uh, follow the link then you can uh, fill in a short survey for us. It would really help us out because we always uh, yeah, try to do better. I would like to emphasize this moment as well that uh, everybody can join today for discussion, also the people watching at home, so if you have a question you can raise your hand. Um, we will be talking about car culture, we will be talking about bikes, we will be talking about the public space, city planning and human behavior. We're going to look at it from a systemic perspective and we're going to look at the effects on a personal level. Um, yeah, so before we start, I just want to uh, see who's in the audience. Um, let's start with the first question, like, who owns a car here? Not too many people. Not too many people. There's no judgment. Um, who here never drives a car? Yeah, so there are also some people in between. Um, I'm just curious. Who has a car? So let me, let me, yeah. So I'm just gonna ask around, like, what do you expect of today? Hi. 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 Hi, hi. Uh, I'm just, yeah, just wondering, what are you uh, curious to hear about today? I do own a car. I got a family of three. Um, so we use it for holidays, for leisure, for work. I cycle to the railway station. I, uh, and then I take the train to Amsterdam. And I like as much as possible to use the bike. And yeah, I like cities that are designed for bikes. Okay. So you're you're just trying to hear more about city planning, yep. okay? Anybody else who has any expectations of what they're looking forward to here today? Yeah, uh, my name is Allard Hasma. I work for Green Wheels. So especially the reasons to know why people are addicted to cars and how we can get them out of their cars. I have a feeling since I work for Green Wheels, but still. Okay. Every what, what is your feeling? Uh, it's freedom. Cars freedom. Anybody else? Well, sorry. Yes, I see. Hi. Hello. Um, so what I am wondering about is what, what story can we tell to make the, the car addicted person realize or realize, it's the wrong word, but want to get out of the car and, uh, and, and not only uh, want that, but also vote for parties that uh, one, two, how do you call it? Yeah. It's interesting you mention that because I think mobility wasn't really an issue during the recent elections. So it's an interesting point. I think we'll get to that. Um, yeah, so before we start, I want to make everyone think a little bit because that's also our slogan. So um, maybe you can discuss with the person who's uh, sitting next to you about the thesis or the stelling that life would be better without cars. 
So, what do you think about that? Life would be better without cars. Just discuss for like two minutes and see what everybody thinks. We will also be discussing it. Shaping of this addiction to cars, it's been about. It's also under the condition that we would have never known them. Like we okay, okay, okay. Can you turn me on again? Okay. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hear a lot of discussion and it's still going on. Uh, anybody who has uh, heard a very interesting uh, thing that their partner has said, or maybe you think you have an awesome thing that you want to share. Would life be better without cars? Who says yes? Okay, so can you tell me why? Uh, well, to nuance it a bit, like, uh, probably in in uh, the denser countries, it would be much better to have a uh, world without cars. Uh, safety and uh, space and quality of life would be... Uh, more space, more safety, better quality of life. Anybody else? Better without cars? Yes? Well, I think in the current situation, it's... Yeah, I would definitely say better without cars, but... Um, uh, coincidentally, this Thursday, I'm going to uh, be part of a commission of the city council, and we're going to talk about floating cars, floating shared, shared floating cars, I guess it's called in English. Um, and yeah, that sounds like a good perspective, because then it will be much easier than public transport, as far as it sounds. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm just trying to... Floating cars, like actual <laughs> floating cars. That's what you're going to talk about? Really? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, so yeah. soon, I'm already using yeah. jargon. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a shared car, so deal auto, um, yeah. but you can return it anywhere you want. So in oh, different cities, floating. no, oh, it's okay. in, it, that's what they call it, You can it, make it float in the, in the canal. So you can just yeah. return it in different cities and you don't need a permit or anything. So probably we just need Very like 5% of idea. the cars that we have now <laughs> and then it would be great. Do cool. It. Yeah, so I was thinking more Jetsons, it's like car. flying cars. Okay. Anybody else? Car. Who thinks the world yeah. would not be better without cars? Life would not be better without cars. Winner is the car industry. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but uh, th this, this weekend I moved uh, and it was very nice to be able to just rent a car and uh, rent a van. Yeah, so a very practical yeah. car. Anybody else want to say something? I think like cars are a very nice privilege in our society. The thing is just that the way that we use it is completely wrong. The whole idea of having a car on your own and um, that it's just there for whatever you need, but most of the time it just stands still somewhere and takes up a lot of space. So I think it would be nice to have a different way of seeing cars and using cars, but I think that cars can, especially for like accidents and or like in a sense of like when something happens and you need an ambulance or something, I mean, what would we do without a car? In a, like it was much more difficult in earlier times. So I think cars have some amazing advantages and we should use them differently. Okay. Um. 
let's discuss this uh, further with our guests today. Um, let me to introduce to you our uh, very international panel of today. Uh, first of all, all the way from Canada, in the middle, we have Dr. Vanessa Timmer. She is the executive director of One Earth Living, a Vancouver-based nonprofit, Think and Do Tank. Uh, advancing sustainable everyday living around the world is their purpose. She's also a senior research fellow at the Utrecht University with the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development. A warm welcome for Vanessa Timmer. Uh, on her right is Dr. Jaime Sosa Para. He is from Chile. He did part of his PhD at the TU Delft and worked there as a postdoc. Uh, since March this year, he is the assistant professor in transport analysis and data science at the Utrecht University. He focuses on the psychology of the driver and the relationship between car dependency and sustainable transportation. Give him a warm welcome, too. And our third guest uh, hails all the way from the Netherlands. His name is Marco uh, de Brummelstroet. On Twitter, he is famous as the Fiets Professor, but in academic circles, he goes by a professor in urban mobility futures, director of the Lab of Thought, and chairman of the board of the Urban Cycling Institute at the Universiteit van Amsterdam. He is interested in how our thinking about mobility futures is structured uh, through underlying narratives, and in his work, cycling plays a big role as a lens to study these narratives and to find new ones. Also, a warm welcome to Marco. <laughs> yeah, welcome all three of you. Um, I think uh, maybe we can start uh, sweet and short. What is your connection to today's theme, like from a professional standpoint, point, but also a personal one? Jaime. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I feel like kind of um, in a weird situation. I'm, I'm a civil engineer. I work in a geography department, and I'm studying the psychology of the car. So it's like I've been trying to find like my, my, my own space, because I think also cars, you can study them and, and look at them uh, from many different angles. So it's not only engineering, or it's not only social sciences, or urban planning, and so on. So yeah, I'm most, uh, my, most of my latest research has been focused around this idea of car dependency and what makes someone to use a car. And how did you get into this specific topic? Was a um, yeah, it's super personal. It's just that uh, I did my thesis, my PhD thesis on public transport and, and how to make it better and understanding way better the circumstances that make someone to use public transport. And I was getting from time to time, even in the in committee meetings or in scientific conferences, like, OK, nice, uh, let's make public transport better. But how do we make people not using public transport to use public transport? And I was not even able to answer that question, because that kind of was out of the sample. I was just only studying people already using public transport. Mm -hmm. So then I started thinking about, OK, maybe I, I need to start taking a look at those that didn't never use it, and they're yeah. kind of out of my data. Yeah, so what drives the driver? We will be talking yeah. about that later. <laughs> Vanessa, what's your, uh, what's your interest in this topic? Well, I got started in uh, the environmental movement at like the age of 14 uh, in Vancouver. It's also the birthplace of Greenpeace, so I was part of kind of this early social movement around um, sustainability. And then I went on to study social movements um, as a sociologist and really think about how do they come about, how do they make change happen. And now with my nonprofit One Earth Living, we're really interested in how do we actually make our everyday life uh, thrive in balance with nature? How do we do that so that we have nature-friendly, climate-friendly, and equitable ways of living? And transportation is a part of that. And so we've, we know that we've got, you know, the last year the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that we can actually achieve 40 to 70% of emission reductions mm -hmm. by 2050 through lifestyle and behavior change, but it needs the right sociocultural policy, technology, infrastructure in place to do that. That's like a huge opportunity, and um, one of the big things that gets spoken about is around moving away from private automobile yeah. transportation. So that's what I'm really interested in, is we actually, in the sustainable living world have a lot of interesting solutions of how we might move away from car addiction. Yeah. And, and those interesting solutions combined with all of you, all the ideas that we have together, I look forward to speaking yeah. about today. We will. Marco, what's your, uh, as the Fiets professor, it's, it's your old brand. <coughs> it 
well, I love cars. Uh, I always loved cars. I, I think they're, all, at least in, in my, uh, when I was young, they were beautifully designed. So I, I always played with cars and I enjoyed them. I still love cars today because I was thinking in the opening discussion, if we don't have cars, we also wouldn't have Formula One. And <laughs> what would I do on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon? Yeah. Um, but that's a very personal... Uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by cars, but from a professional standpoint, I think what we... Uh, I think we often confuse the car as the problem, and for, what for me as a social scientist int is interesting is that it, I think it's a manifestation of the underlying problem. So it's a, such a strong symbol of the time that we live in, uh, quite recent actually, but th th trying to understand how uh, our worldviews, beliefs and values have uh, solidified into the system that we are going to discuss this evening, I think is fascinating. Yeah. To understand where it comes from, how it was created, but especially why it is so hard to change. Yeah. Yeah, so we framed it around uh, the catchy uh, question, uh, how can we cure our addiction? So I think it's good like, to maybe take a short look at what this uh, addiction looks like. So I, I looked up some numbers. At the beginning of this year, there were more than 8.9 million passenger cars in the Netherlands. Compared to four years ago, the number of passenger cars increased by 5.6%. 88% of all passenger cars are privately owned, the rest is owned by a company. And once someone owns a car, they are not quick to part with it. In 2040, there will be an estimated 10 million cars in the Netherlands. So that would be 523 cars per thousand uh, inhabitants. I also, um, let's, let me see. Yeah, so here you can also see a divide. This is also, I think, uh, a part of the addiction. So some people have multiple cars. And we also can see that the, the, the cars get bigger. So that is, I think, one side of an illustration of what the addiction looks like. And every year there are uh, new roads are built because of traffic jams. Many, many politicians promise more lanes. So I think, yeah, like you said, like how did we get there? Um, and we have a small clip to set the scene of how we got there. Futurama used scale models to depict the future of America. Designers created the scenes with 50,000 vehicles, 10,000 of which would be moving, over 500,000 buildings, and over 1 million trees. Guests would sit in armchairs that were connected to a 140-ton conveyor system that was referred to as a carry-go-round. It was essentially an Omnimover before Omnimovers even existed. Those chairs would whisk them off from scene to scene while a narrator would describe what they were seeing. See, GM noted that the nest of roadways in America at the time were a mess, and that at the rate people were buying cars, 1960 would see over 38 million automobiles on the road. They argued that by that point, the country would need nationwide express highways. So Futurama pitched just that. It proposed the idea of massive 14-lane interstate highways where drivers could travel at speeds of anywhere from 50 to 100 miles per hour. Yeah, so Vanessa, you uh, recommended this video. It's uh, from the 1939 World Fair, right? Called the Futurama. Can you tell us a little bit how did this World Fair ride predict or shape our future? Yeah, this one was, uh, this whole exhibit was created by Norman Bel Geddes for General Motors, and it was the most popular event at the uh, uh, the New York World Fair, 1939, 5.1 million people went through this. And when they, as they went through the exhibit, they started with those kind of helicopter views of how the fragmented road system in the United States uh, was actually envisioned to become a seamless interstate highway system. And so the idea of General Motors is to start showing it as, and not just that, like the buildings also had helipads on the top and um, and a lot of the, and as you move through the exhibit, there started to be these um, other envision, like envisions of um, cars with pedestrian pack walkways over top, and then it got closer and closer in scale, and then the participants or the people attending walked out mm -hmm. into a plaza that was literally a life-size version of what they'd just seen on, on a model. And then they got a badge that said, I have seen the future. Yeah. And so this was an incredibly powerful um, image of what a good city looks like. And, and actually, the suburbs weren't even very common at the time yet. That was yet to come. Yeah. Uh, but 
you know, from something like 20 million cars in the states, it went to 67 million in 10 years. And the interstate highway system that was built in the states was has been like the largest public works project um, in existence. And so, and there was so much um, public marketing around this. You know, uh, everything from you know the advertising around living in the suburbs being the ideal life. But one of the most interesting is that people were using cars to commute, but there was also this creation of this idea of the Sunday drive, which is where families would pack up, throw some sandwiches in the car and go for a drive um, and use the car for their public leisure, for their leisure as well. So it was really, def it was the defining of an American way of life. And that vision of what a city looks like and the interstate highways and this kind of private car ownership has traveled across the world yeah. is the vision of what a good city looks like. So it was actually sort of a advertisement maybe for General Motors and what they were doing or wanted to do with the future? That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and was everybody thrilled at the time? They were like, everyone's like, yay, cars, or? Well, actually, there was a huge pushback, and this is the thing that, you know, I think what's really promising, thinking about moving beyond car addiction, is that we often think of this as a technical challenge to be overcome. How do we make cars more effect, uh, like electric or mm -hmm. um, do a bit of traffic calming here and there? Uh, but the reality is that this was a deeply cultural project to shift uh, from a city that's focused on people to a city that's focused on cars. And so... A lot of the cities around the world have, you know, so much of their land space is now taken over by cars. But also in, for example, the night the cars saw some of the pushback because um, streets, which used to be much more for everybody, mm -hmm. um, there was an active campaign in the 1920s to move uh, towards jaywalking, so crossing in the middle of the street becoming illegal. And it was passed to become illegal, but nobody was listening to it. And the reason it was, um, there was a huge pushback because vulnerable populations particularly were getting hit by cars, elderly, children, dogs, cats, like everything. So there was this real um, pushback around the car. And so then there was this move by the car lobby to, to for example, um, uh, ban jaywalking and when when people weren't listening to the rules and laws, they actually created a cultural campaign where they had clowns uh, being hit by cars, and they just made it, they carried people off of the road. Mm -hmm. So they made it a kind of shame and cultural project, and so to the point where jaywalking became yep. illegal. So we see how it's not just a technical solution of let's get the interstate highways, build these cars, but also it's a deeply cultural project over time to convince people that this is the way to move um, and how, and I mean, look at car commercials today, you know, you see somebody driving in a car and it, and it is, it's all about freedom, right? They're, they're driving often through rivers, like they're up and down mountains. And then our experience of being in cars is really like sitting, <laughs> sitting yeah. in a, you know, it's not that idea of freedom. You know, yes, yeah. we can listen to a podcast, but we're, we're often stuck in traffic, so. Yeah, so you say it's deeply cultural. I know that in the English world, the word car culture is like a thing, like people know what that is. Could you briefly explain what car culture means? Or maybe in America or in Canada, but what does it mean to you guys? Well, I think it's, it can refer to a number of different things. I think car culture is this car-dependent society we've created. And it's also, a, there's a kind of car culture in the sense of, there's this great cartoon where two fish are swimming and an older fish says, how do you like the water? And they're like, it's great. And then the old fish goes by and the fish, little fish turn to each other and say, what's water? Like, they don't know, right? Because if you've grown up in a car culture, it's actually really hard to see how much our lives have been shaped around it. So I think there's that part of the car culture. But there's also what Marco was referencing, which is that cars as objects and as cultural um, experiences, everything from um, NASCAR to the Barbie car to, you know, there's a lot of ways that we have, we, we love our cars also because they give us an opportunity to have conversations with our children or, you know, have that sense of, of uh, signaling to others that we've made it yeah. or the kind of rite of passage of getting your first set of keys or passing down a car. These are really deeply cultural yeah. aspects. And so I think some of the possibilities for moving past addiction sit in the same 
place? Yep. How do we create rite of passage and shifts in culture at key life moments? I think that's going to be a big um, opportunity in shifting car culture. Yeah, let's explore later on if we, how we can uh, envision that. So Marco, car culture, we just heard a little bit of what it's like in uh, Northern America. Um, is autoculture, is that a thing? I, I, was, I was thinking, I, I'm, pr I'm pretty old, I think, if I look around, but maybe a question to the Dutch people, if you've ever seen the movie Flodder? It's okay, don't be embarrassed, I've seen it too. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually that movie would that movie would not be allowed now because there's a rape scene in it. You you probably also know it. Buurman, what do you know? Can you know it? Yeah. yeah. That that scene is actually on a Citroën car. Yeah. Because the entire Flutter franchise is is uh, is, or is is sponsored by Citroën. <laughs> and if you look again at the film with this uh, notion, you see that it's uh, it's a big commercial about suburban living. Um, and, and this whole notion that even at the, the final uh, scene where, they, where all neighbors come to visit the, the party at the flooded house, yeah. they all come by car. All right, so uh, one even comes by tank, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> <right? laughs> so so yeah, that so is car culture in the Netherlands. Or yeah, we, when we were studying this, we also found out that there was actually a quite clear vehicle how this uh, knowledge spread around the world. And in the case of Europe, that was the Marshall, uh, the Marshall Plan in which uh, the US uh, uh, supported uh, European countries after the Second World War to rebuild themselves. And there was a very uh, clear uh, underlying um, rationale that uh, the money was uh, connected to all kinds of uh, US style uh, planning principles and one of them was this idea of traffic engineering. Um, and that, that's what I find interesting also to go one step uh, back is this, this whole notion of, of the system that we just saw. And I, I, Last week I, I talked with the fourth year traffic engineers, so the people that learn this crazy language to, to think about the world. In, in, in Windesheim, and I asked them if they knew uh, who were the, the founding um, fathers, in that case, of traffic engineering, and they didn't. So the fourth year traffic engineers didn't know. Does anybody here know? No, there's a couple. Yeah? Who, who were, so who were the first people that wrote the syllabus for traffic engineering? Water engineering, water engineering. yeah. So what you see there is that the, the water engineers were asked, like, develop this new language in the 1930s. Didn't exist. They had to figure something out. And then if you see it, you see, oh, that's why we talk about flow. That's why we are so concerned if there's uh, if people waiting, because it means the system is clogging. We don't want the system to clog, because sewage systems are also designed for maximum intensity. That's why every half an hour on Dutch radio stations, you will hear that people are waiting somewhere in the system. I, I wait all the time for an elevator or <laughs> to, have, to have a beer, but that's never on the news. No. But somehow, if you're in a car on the highway system and you have to wait somewhere, uh, it, it gets 360 minutes a week per radio. That's six hours of radio yeah. time. until. So Because I think one of the things that I, when I was listening to you, this is not something old. This is still ongoing. Yeah. This is, this, the, there is still a huge system, uh, um, implicit system, not evil people, but an uh, implicit system that keeps on pushing the same idea that indeed makes all the, the mobility programs of the political parties very similar, with the similar goals, the similar values, and the only discussion is about uh, the type of engine we, we put in it. Uh, so I think that was also mentioned earlier as one of the expectations, is what would be different stories that we can tell, and I think that's, well, we, we, we'll discuss yeah. later probably, but that's, I think, the key question. Because if we are not going to retell that story that the water engineers started to tell, we will not change anything. No. Um, yeah, so we say that uh, we're addicted to cars. Yeah. What is the biggest reason we should get clean? Oh, um, I, th I thought we were going to the cure already. So uh, Both. Okay, so, because they they're connected. I think the biggest reason is the simple uh, observation that the costs of this system that we have been able to externalize, which means that the costs that exist we know exist, but we just tend to ignore because we can push it away. Those costs are about 60% uh, of the uh, entire cost. They are not covered by the user, uh, which means that the system in itself, we don't even have to discuss that any, any longer. If it's a vis vision or that, that we think it needs to change, it is a f it's a fact of life that a system that costs so much more than it gives will not sustain. So like, it's it's the money that is needed for the infrastructure. For yeah, example. for instance, for yeah. instance, but also the, uh, uh, since the 1953 uh, um, 
flooding disaster in the Netherlands, which killed 1,800 people and which made us build this entire Delta Works. Since then, 112,000 people died in traffic in the Netherlands alone. Uh, and that's a cost that you cannot even put yeah. a number on. It's huge. It's incredibly big. Um, uh, the cost of infrastructure, uh, the entire uh, network, if you have a car, use the car, uh, you are often on the highway system in the Netherlands. It's completely paid for by uh, the liquid gas uh, um, uh, money that we received. As we all know, we stopped doing that, so we don't have that money anymore. Uh, and last, on this year, uh, the Minister of Transport even said that all the money that was allocated for investment in future roads uh, now has to be uh, taken to, to do the, the, the basic repair. So we have a system that we cannot even maintain. Uh, the costs of that in the future will only run up. Uh, so the simple fact is that that system, as we currently all take for granted and all our lives depend on it, to a certain extent, cannot sustain. It will not exist in 200 years, no. period. So there's no discussion about that. The discussion is then is, how are we going to adapt to that situation? Yeah. Uh, Jaime, yeah. you, uh, <laughs> if we want to look at ways how to get clean, uh, we should also know why people are hooked, I think. So you have studied private car drivers' attitudes. Mm. What, uh, what we discussed, like what drives the driver? Why are people sitting in cars? Yeah, so many of the things Vanessa already mentioned, like um, what I, I, today I was uh, giving a lecture also and some of the things I already discussed with the students that Sometimes when you are just studying transportation decisions, um, you oversimplify the, these decisions to just measures of travel times or waiting times or maybe crowding conditions, right? But the car, as we've been already discussing, way, it, it means way more. It's, it's not just a transportation mean, right? So it has all these kind of associated dimensions that you, in, to some extent you only experience as a human being with the car and not with other transportation modes. And maybe there are some uh, relationships with other uh, modes, maybe the bike or, or, or maybe a train in, in certain conditions. But being more specific, some of, uh, one of these uh, dimensions that, has, um, that, that people constantly refer to the why they use a car uh, also, some people in the audience mentioned that, like the convenience or the utility that you care for cars, that you you, got, you are protected from the weather. Uh, you have also this autonomy to move wherever you can or whenever you like, and you don't need to wait uh, uh, for for a, for a public vehicle to arrive uh, to your next to your corner or something. Um, also, the capacity to move things, right? Uh, that. Uh, for in, in the if context of moving, move, yeah. exactly, right? So those, that, that's the first thing that comes. Um, and then what was surprising for me in, in this studying of uh, the different attitudes is that uh, the, the second thing that people usually come uh, or, or explains more this decision of owning and using a car has to do with this uh, symbolic dimension, like how you, what, you, what you want to communicate to your family, to your friends, or to your society in general with your car. Because mm -hmm. the, you, you don't just buy a generic car, which maybe, to some extent, bikes can be a little more generic, that they're very similar, they, they can have a different number of gears, uh, and, and that's kind of it. But then there's a lot of people either buying cars from the US, or European cars, or luxury cars, or now electric cars. And then if you buy an electric car, are you buying these tiny kind of efficient uh, cars, or are you buying like a big Tesla, like it, it's super luxurious with a kind of an iPad uh, next to you, right, yeah. in, in, the, in the radio? Um, so if you drive a Toyota Corolla or Ferrari, it, like, it tells a lot about there, a person. Right? Yeah. I mean, a car is not just a car. It's not just a car. No. I mean, it mean you, you want to, I don't know, do you even need a Ferrari? I mean, if, if you're, not if you are like a, a <laughs> Formula One racer, right? Uh, they're not doing very well, actually, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Everybody here, a Formula One fan, <laughs> uh, <No>. ironic. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, do uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I think because um, to, to bring something in, because I think mm -hmm. you're completely right and, and, uh, and it's a very interesting um, uh, pathway to, but, but I think we need, maybe already now, to bring in uh, sort of the elephant in the room because I, I have a, an allergy for this, uh, trying to figure out why individuals use something mm -hmm. and ignoring the fact that we are subsidizing that, that same element that they're using. <coughs> 
I said earlier, at, uh, at least 60% of the cost of owning and using a car are not internalized by this person. And that this yeah. person will never tell you that. They will not say, I drive a car because inc it's incredibly cheap for the cost that, it, that I incur on society. Um, so if this is all true, and if people are, are willing, uh, if, if utility uh, and if the market uh, uh, works, uh, I think also this is, by the way, this should be FFD policy, then we should not distort the market and we should just ask the full price. So we should just tell these people, if you really think that this car is somehow useful for uh, uh, bringing stuff from A to B, which it probably is, mm -hmm. then you should also be willing to pay 100% of the price for society. Yep. Uh, and as long as we don't do it, we are discussing, so if you compare it, it, we, it would be, and in Germany is actually the case, is, uh, uh, you go to a village in Germany and uh, on almost every corner of the street there's a cigarette uh, machine still to this day. So just imagine that, and then also imagine that uh, the cigarettes in that machine are uh, underpriced to the extent that you can that we can all buy it, even kids can buy it, okay, sixty yeah. percent uh, off price. Um, and then uh, in that situation, we would go door by door and ask people, why do you use cigarettes? I have these nicotine stitches. You can just put the nicotine on your arm. Yeah. Why are you not doing this? And we do all we do all these studies, and I, I feel that we are sort of because of that, we are not. Uh, um, Acknowledging that this basic fact that the 9 million cars that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, only exist uh, because we inflated the demand by subsidizing the supply. Yeah, but, but Jaime, you mentioned that mm -hmm. you were researching uh, public transportation uh -huh. and you were saying, but I don't understand why people aren't using public transportation and exactly. that's why you got into this. Mm -hmm. So what did this, what kind of insight did this give you in terms of looking why people aren't using public transportation. Yeah, well, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying, right? I mean, there is a huge fact that uh, the use of the car is heavily subsidized, right? Yeah. Um, but then, given the current conditions that the, the, this kind of implicit subsidy that the use of the car is having, then people are just making the decision. And then if they have all these different values that they associate to cars and they just observe all the other possible options. They just pick the one that they believe is best or they perceive is the best for them, uh, depending on how much they value that the, the, the total effect it may have on the society, right? But in the end, people from a very economical perspective are just making these decisions based on what they perceive or what they experience. So. Exactly. If we don't, if we don't make them experience the kind of the reality or the real world, what they are producing, in the end, uh, they, they will just stick with their current decisions. And that's, that also kind of reminds me. I, we discussed this uh, briefly um, during the, during the meeting preparing for this occasion. And there was in in, in Stockholm, so maybe you remember this uh, congestion charging trial mm -hmm. happened like 15, uh, 17 years ago. <coughs> And in the end, it was, uh, it was a beautiful life experiment that in, in, in the city, they decided to charge for using the car um, f during f six months. So at the beginning of the trial, people were kind of internalizing a bit more, not to the full extent, but the, the use of the car because they have to pay every time they get to the congested area and congestion went down and travel times got better, etc. But then they experienced that, but then you remove and the, the charging, the congestion charging trial ended and next day congestion is back again, right? Because they stop experiencing uh, the actual cost of, of the, this added cost is not being part of their decisions, right? So the, if we want to actually pursue people to start using more other more sustainable ways of transportation we should start i agree with making also people experience and perceive all the costs that uh, makes not only for them but also for the society vanessa yeah I, I just want to kind of pick up on cost and um say that for many people like owning a car has become a must because they um, because of housing prices have been um, have to move further out of a city where they might be working or people with disabilities, for example, in order to easily move around, might be using a car. We saw also an increase in private car ownership or and use during COVID, also for people who had concerns about airborne diseases compared to public transport. So, you know, for some, they're actually the cost of driving a car and needing to own a car because of the we've, way we've designed our cities and how expensive other aspects of life are. Some people are going, 
you know, maybe not eating as well as they could or not necessarily heating their houses as well as they could. Um, so it, because they end up needing to use a car, and cars are so costly. So I just want to put the other side of the cost equation on here and to say that, you know, also when we look at urban versus rural populations, also in the Netherlands, you know, the amount of people that talk about, um, you know, the increase that they feel that they're becoming car dependent is hovering around 35% in urban areas and it's over 60% for those who are living in rural areas. So when we think about adding the cost, we also have to think about how all of these changes need to be deeply equitable and need to be looked at through that lens mm -hmm. and how some people are currently feeling the costs very highly, yep. but because of the way we've designed our cities and our infrastructure and where our work is and where our housing is, the cost of housing, that that's actually costing them, uh, you know, they have to own a car yeah. at this point, yeah. Marco? Yeah, but with the risk that we do not uh, yeah. get the second question, <laughs> um, because I think we are, this is touching, uh, so if you, if you look at land use and mobility systems or uh, all the things that you describe, we should be, uh, first of all, be accepting that they are not a given. They are the result of market distortions. Mm -hmm. If we distort the market and make mobility easier, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in the Netherlands, you get a tax reduction the further you live away from your work. Um, for good reasons, we, we introduced those, all those things. They resulted in the fact that companies started to uh, f find economies of scale, supermarkets found economies of scale, distances grew between 19, uh, 1970 and now. The average distance of a Dutch person grew from seven kilometers per hour uh, per day, seven kilometers to more than 40. Yeah. And that's not a given, that is a result of the fact that we uh, actively distorted that system. So I agree that it needs to, that change needs to be equitable, but first of all, I think we should put the, the real, if slowly maybe, but if we are not um, uh, putting the real price of that, those choices on the user, uh, all these things will never uh, go back to 15-minute uh, uh, cities, for instance, because we will keep distorting the market. So we can do that, and I think as soon as we do that, as soon as we sort of uh, bite the bullet and say, well, we can no longer uh, afford this system, we need to slowly in the next seven, because this system is built in, what, 70 years? We really tried our best, didn't work. So let's use the next 70 years to slowly go, uh, to go uh, back or to another direction. And then uh, use the money, that, because, for instance, we spent 8 billion a year in the Dutch uh, tax revenue on the highway system. If we want to subsidize uh, car travel for people that really need it, that can be much cheaper mm -hmm. and much more dedicated. Instead of now spending it mostly on people that commute to their cubicle, yeah. they don't need the subsidies. They can do without. Um, but again, I think this whole problem starts with this no the notion that we often have is that this system and the fact that people uh, go and live in suburbs because the housing prices are cheaper, that is not a given, that's a result. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason why those houses are cheaper, because we, can, we uh, subsidize people to go there. Yeah. 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 So, food for thought. Also, also by the yeah. way, the same goes for trains. We should not uh, ignore that either. Trains are also subsidized. Uh, so traveling in it, uh, is, is uh, uh, traveling far, uh, uh, with co which costs energy, is subsidized, and and it's not easy to just stop that. Uh, because I live in Ada, I want to go take the train for uh, almost free. I love that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. But it's, it's not easy to to solve that. But I think that's the key underlying issue. Um, I'm not an economist, but according to economic reasoning, and again, FIFA should put this in their pr uh, policy program, mm -hmm. uh, they should uh, want to take away market distortion and let the system restore itself. Or other itself. parties. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or other parties. Okay, let, let's just take a look at the no audience and uh, <laughs> see if anybody has any questions after what we heard just now. Anybody a question? Yeah, I see here. Well, my question is, this is, we're not the only people thinking about this, right? And uh, there must be good examples around the globe where countries or governments have thought, let's, let's put a fair price on, on travel and, and, uh, and those distances and see how that resulted and if we can learn from that. So do you have some good examples that we can talk about? Me or you? 
I just want to say that there's a lot of, um, there's a big movement towards car-free centers of cities. So you're seeing that in many places from Chengdu, China to, you know, the expanding, oh, Venice, of course, is a classic example, but there's a lot of places where um, we're actually seeing experimentation in terms of car-free areas within a city. And I think the main thing that we want to make sure we do is actually think about that movement in and out of that, that car-free area. So that's, um, so yes, there's a, great car-free campaign that's worth looking at, where you look at, there, where you can see these examples around the world of not just car-free areas, but also car-free days in places that are transitioning away from cars. So that's a big thing we're seeing also in North America is these car-free days as a way of giving people that experience of what, uh, what it feels like to move around their neighborhood again the way it was before cars. Yeah, Mark? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating question. And there is indeed, there are a lot of examples, even of real markets. Uh, so the example of Stockholm is mentioned, London is doing it, uh, Singapore is doing it. It's done everywhere. And somehow in the Netherlands, we think it's very hard to put road pricing as a scheme. There, there are uh, tens and tens of cities that do this already for decades. Um, but I think this points to something more interesting is you can put the costs on driving and then make the system uh, economically fair you can also reduce the costs themselves. And you can do that by excluding cars from certain areas. But in the Netherlands, what's currently going on, most cities from next year on, they will go from 50 to 30 as a standard. And that by itself is already reducing the costs of traffic fatalities, of the use of space. Uh, streets can become um, uh, more useful for other purposes. So I think that's, that's a more interesting way to go instead of uh, the market pricing thing and... and uh, incentivizing people to do the right thing has all kinds of problems. So reducing the cost themselves, making things slower helps. I think the most fascinating example, last week there was an NOS article about uh, the parking pressure and that all cities in the Netherlands experienced too little parking spots. Oh, what could be the problem? Um, uh, and I, 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 su I suggested to the journalist to take a look at Japan. And Japan has a, already for more than 30 years uh, a policy where you can only buy a car, a private vehicle, if you can show that you can park it either on your private property or at a rented parking space. N your problem will not be solved in public space, as your problem with your fridge or your cow will also not be solved in public space. Uh, and that's, uh, that's also, again, a way of not externalizing those costs on society, but the, uh, the journalist just doesn't want to go there. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to... to and, and that we yeah. had a small discussion in the beginning. I think it, the underlying notion is that we all, maybe not we as a group, but we overall, we feel that we are, are definitely uh, losing a big part of the comfort of our lives if we acknowledge the fact that this system cannot sustain. And just to give you two other examples, in Wales, they actually are gonna, yeah. they've stopped all road building, future road building projects because they did an assessment of the costs and realized they needed to shift away from road building. And then also the OECD worked with the, with the country of Ireland to look at its transportation plan and, um, and did some really interesting shifting of how they define the problem. So instead of thinking about how do we support private mobility, they act, they ask the question, how do we actually make sure people have access to what they need for a good quality of life? And when they change the goal of the of the question, of the policy question from mobility, like how do we make sure people get good electric vehicles, and to access, what ended up happening is it shifted the focus from a massive electric vehicle uh, infrastructure, which is what the initial plan was, to actually looking at complete compact neighborhoods, increased public transport, and other priorities becoming number one, and actually, as, as uh, Marco was saying, really increasing the prices around private car ownership. And so, yes, there was still electric vehicle infrastructure, but the plan that's now in place emphasizes accessibility in a world in which car dependency is not the norm. So I think that's another great example of not thinking about how we switch out the car, but how we rethink the system. Um, anyone else? Thank you. I'm enormously sympathetic to what you're saying, but what I hear so far is only an argument based upon urban thinking upon city thinking. And you've only got to look at the example of the yellow jackets in France, or indeed in very rural Wales, or in many parts of Europe and further beyond, 
to know that you've got to think outside the cities as well to help solve this problem. How do you react to that? Me? Yeah. Difference between like a rural and more city yeah, but landscape. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I have a clear answer, but I think it also comes back with the, that the challenges that sometimes the people living in rural areas are facing are also kind of product of because of the way that we have built these urban urbanities around car dependency. So yeah. it's a very complex problem to solve, right? Because when we, at the very beginning, we were kind of triggered with this question of uh, would you prefer to have like a, a world without cars? It's kind of unfair to imagine this world, right? Like, and just we just remove all the cars in, in a snap of a finger, and then we just stay with the cities and the rural areas that we already built, right? So I think that if we want to make the transition, that it's not something that's going to happen uh, in one day or in five years or in even maybe 10. We, we need more time to kind of, kind of come back, as you were saying, Marco. Like, if, if, if it, this took like 70 years to get to this point, and we realize that this is not working, then maybe we need even 70 or maybe even more. I, I have no idea. But it, it's something that goes step by step in, in, in how we can uh, actually make this transition happen. Yeah, and, and uh, combined, I completely agree, is that uh, if you go back, s again, 70 years before we started to uh, create this sort of centrifugal force of mobility, uh, average distances were very fitting also in rural areas, and there were banks and, uh, and hospitals and, and uh, supermarkets. I, I'm from the Achterhoek, so I know I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the, it was there. Um, and it can, it can return, but then you need to, and again, you need to uh, uh, understand all these market forces and, and the system and how it behaves uh, accordingly. Um, what I think is also an interesting point, but that's also a rabbit hole in itself, is this, this, um, the experience of resistance against change. Uh, obviously, all change will, re will uh, get uh, some resistance, but again, research in, in Wales especially showed this notion that I really advise you to check out if you're interested in it, it's called pluralistic ignorance. And it's the notion that we, uh, in all kinds of uh, realms of, of uh, public life, but also around mobility, we, we see uh, that um, we, if we ask people if you're, uh, if you're in support of, um, of, a change, of a progressive change, always around 70 to 80% of the people uh, can follow that. They are willing to, they are not uh, opposed to that. So only 20% of people, 20 to 30% of people are opposed to that. And we shouldn't ignore that, but that's the fact. If you then ask the same people, how many other people do you think would support this? They think it's only 30%. Mm. So the majority of people that actually want a better quality of life, a better quality of the streets, that do not want to be scared about their children's life every day that they go to sports or school, uh, all those people are now silent because they, in the current narratives that we talk, they always think, well, this taxi driver that's shouting against his plan to cut the Wespenstraat, he will, he's probably representing the majority, so let it, let it go. Uh, so I think there's a need, uh, if you want to overcome that, there's a need, first of all, to experiment and to show to people, hey, let's first experiment. We, made a, we compiled a list, it's, it's uh, this long, it's, no, it's, it's about 25 entries of uh, aldermen and uh, mayors, and that started already in 1980 in Groningen. And the most recent one is uh, Anne Hidalgo uh, and just before the Philip Watteau. All of these people received death threats before they uh, introduced uh, uh, car-free measures in their cities. Okay, but they did it anyway. None of them were killed. Uh, all of them uh, received a huge amount of public support afterwards. This shows that this silent majority actually uh, becomes aware of what they, what they can lose if they do not back up and support uh, these changes that they benefit from. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's a way to overcome it. Let's talk about yeah. this a little uh, bit more when we get uh, to the uh, next part. But first I want to um, invite... Uh, we have, uh, with the Science Café, it's always a collaboration with Mensen zeggen dingen, people say things, just in English. And it's an initiative with more like poetry and art. So today we have somebody who's also going to give us a poem. It's Nicole Kaandorp, and uh, she will give you a poem. It's in Dutch, but uh, maybe uh, we can give a, a, <laughs> a short uh, translation which she's done. So please give it up for Nicole Kaandorp. Hi, thank you. Um, so 
for all of you English speaking people, I am so sorry. I could not for the for the life of me write a poem in English. Um but I will also introduce it in Dutch and I thought it would be fair to give you a, a short English introduction to the Dutch poem as well. Um I tried to write a poem against cars because I feel for me personally I don't need one. Um I'm fine with other people having cars. So I tried to write a poem in which I am like, no, cars are stupid, blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't because without cars, I wouldn't be born. And my parents wouldn't have met. Uh, so then I tried to write a poem about, not, it's not against cars, but in favor of what I think life would look like if there were less. So now in Dutch. Hallo iedereen. <laughs> Fijn dat mensen die lachen, die, die verstaan mij. Dat is goed. Goed. Zoals ik al zei, als er geen auto's waren, had ik niet bestaan. Uh, misschien een beter mens in plaats van mij, maar niet ik. Ik probeerde voor vanavond een gedicht tegen auto's te schrijven. Ze ergeren me, maar ik heb er ook mijn leven aan te danken, dus het voelde mis. Kijk, mijn moeder is Hongaars en mijn vader komt uit Alkmaar. Ze ontmoeten elkaar op een uitwisselingsproject in een tijd waarin benzine nog redelijk goedkoop was, ook in guldens. En er was helemaal niks mis met fossiele brandstoffen of zo leek het dan. Er was nog hoop en alles was vooruitgang, et cetera. Als mijn vader toen, later, zijn auto niet was ingestapt om mijn moeder nog eens terug te vinden, haar adres op een papiertje gekrabbeld, een dorp, 600, 1600 kilometer verderop, was ik er niet geweest. Dan was mijn pa met een Nederlandse en mijn mams met een Hongaar en hadden ze andere kinderen die andere dingen deden, maar in ieder geval niet dit gedicht schreven. Dus weet ik niet of ik tegen auto's ben, ja vanaf nu misschien minder graag, maar zonder dat ik niet bestaan. En daarom heb ik een ander gedicht geschreven. Niet tegen auto's, maar voor alles wat er misschien voor in de plaats kan zijn. En het heet Een poging tot een zacht en inefficiënt leven. Ik ben in een war van winterdekens, licht bezweet en vol bijtend cynisme wakker geworden. Kutland, kutdag. In mijn droom had ik iets nog vast, waarvan ik de zwaarte ochtends in mijn handpalmen zocht. Ik was het kwijt. En had het nooit gehad. Dus ik heb al het handige laten staan. En ben naar kantoor gaan lopen. Het duurde van 8 uur 40 tot 10 uur 17. En alles was verregend. De posterpulp onder een wildplakzuil. Ik. Het gedruis van autobanden over natte wegen. Mensen met haast. Ik had haast moeten hebben. Maar het was me allemaal even ontstegen. Kinderlego in de vensterbank. Een vermiste hond aan een lantaarnpaal geplakt, reclame voor een nieuw soort chips, voor een stoeltraplift, voor een tweede kamerlid. En toen heel lang stilgestaan, bij het lijkje van een rat, in de smalle berm geschoven, met een pas geplukte paardenbloem erop, nog vers melkwit uit de stengel. En zo nog een paar meer van die tekenen, dat er mensen zijn die het nog niet hebben opgegeven. Dank je Do you want to try? Uh, well, I, I just want to say what moved me about your poem is to talk about the soft and inefficient life and how our car culture has also been about speed. You know, like everything moves quickly and we're more isolated from each other. And, you know, the, the paint, the, the way you've painted a picture of tuning in in a different way, the the details of and the beauty of everyday life that happens when we do slow down, um, when we do really pay attention to the world around us. And it makes me think about a study around addiction that was done at the University of British Columbia in my hometown of Vancouver, Canada. And it was by Bruce Alexander. And basically, he had a bunch of rats in a cage uh, with a like a water filled, uh, like a thing that they can drink from, one with just water and one with water with drugs in them. And in an empty cage by themselves, the rats would always go out for the drugged water. And then he had a different cage, which was filled with rats with each other and it had playthings and it had all sorts of incredible, it was like a rat party place. And in that, they still had water, plain water and water with drugs. The rats didn't go to the drugged water. They just drank regular water. And so Johan Hari, who did a TED talk about addiction, who 
you know, is a complicated, um, has a complicated history, but I did really love what he said where he says, you know, the cure to addiction is not sobriety, like stopping something. The cure to addiction is connection. Mm -hmm. And so if we have much more connection, if we tune in and if we slow down, and not always, I think, but just this pace of life, the online, mm -hmm. the online ordering, the kind of getting somewhere quickly that a school ends and soccer pra practices, football practices like 10 minutes later, everything is like yeah. organized around car mobility. And so when we start thinking about the changes that we're thinking, that we're talking about, I think we can talk also about a soft and inefficient life as being a big part of what we move towards. It, it's also, I think, thank you, Nicole, for your wonderful performance, but also the perfect segue to our next video, which is about traffic calming. calming. <laughs> so um, this is from uh, the guy who has a YouTube channel, uh, Not Just Bikes. And uh, <laughs> Not just bikes. there's a fan. And it's just, I, I love his channel um, because it really gives you a new perspective on your own surroundings. So I just wanted to show this uh, short clip from uh, Not Just Bikes. All credit to him. This two-way residential road is 10 meters wide, and the, quote, traffic calming is nothing but a few speed bumps. There's no one-way streets, raised crossings, continuous sidewalks, rough road surfaces, narrowed lanes, chicanes, street cuts, or anything else. This tells you all you need to know about traffic calming in Canada. Compare that to the Netherlands, where traffic calming is baked into the national road safety guidelines. It doesn't matter if you're in a major city or in a village, if you're near the city center or in a suburb. All streets are required to follow the same national guidelines. It's still possible to find streets that are not traffic calmed, but that will usually only happen if the street hasn't had a redesign in the past few decades. Yeah, so um, this is about traffic calming, it's about public space. Um, Jaime, on your uh, profile page, you mentioned you are very interested in the fair use of the public space. Yeah. Uh, you have a book called Recht van de Snelste, which is, uh, I don't know, what's the English? Which, do you have an English uh, translation for your book? Yeah, but it's called Movement. Oh. <laughs> Well, the right of the I wanted to <laughs> right of the fast. And so the public space and our surroundings and our streets is really also about fairness and I and rights. People feeling they have the rights to something. What do you, what's your um, yeah idea of the fair use of the public space or streets? <clears throat> yeah, I, many things coming to my mind actually. Um, can I deviate a little before? Sorry? So can I deviate a little? Yeah, yeah. sure. So just that I, because I was just looking at the video and, and, and of the traffic calm, and it's just a big coincidence that, uh, as I was just saying, uh, I was uh, giving a lecture today and also showed like a, uh, not just bikes, uh, yeah. uh, video. And this was one on a different topic, kind of related. Uh, this kind of the, it's called like uh, the Downs Thompson paradox. So it's kind of a, this, uh, topic or this idea of the interaction between uh, cars and all the other transportation modes. Yeah. So at the end of that video, he shows the, this type of different traffic calming and he has this idea of, uh, actually he, this person refers to Dutch people complaining, oh, I have to wait uh, until all the bikes uh, get cr uh, cross uh, so I can have some space to move my car or I need to make this big detour in order to get from point A to point B, even though it's, it's just next corner. And the thing is that because of how space is used and all the interactions and traffic congestion and so on, that if you allow for cars to just go straight from point A to point B, you start just getting more congestion and they, then finally it will just take longer than the detour. Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of how you kind of build this type of uh, um, environments that have this fairer use of the space, but at the same time, some, uh, I will say that many of those times uh, you, can, you can kill kind of two birds with one shot by just uh, also making the, ca the car more expensive, relatively speaking, and, and with quote marks, it's not about the money, but it's also about travel times and, and the inconvenience mm -hmm. of using the car. And by doing that, you are also not only encouraging the um, fairer use of the space for also for people, but also for 
uh, to, to make everyone better. It's not only people driving the car, but also all the other people uh, using other transportation modes getting to their destinations faster. Yeah. And also, I, I, I kind of reminded in terms of this idea of fair use of space, uh, maybe some of you have seen this, this uh, I don't know the author, but it's like a comic stripe, and it's like people like walking like next to the walls, and with big cliffs instead of roads because it's called Yuch. Yeah, so it, it's like it, it's fascinating because it's kind of what happens. I mean, there is no a cliff, right? But you're not allowed to go to the car area uh, because basically you are putting your life at risk, right? If you just jump out and start using the, this huge amount of space. I th you also, I think you also put uh, this uh, GIF thingy on, on Twitter. Maybe it wasn't you. I don't know. Like when there's a snow falling, I think I don't remember where. But then you don't see the streets, and you only see like the paths of different vehicles. And, but then if you remove the snow, you get to see that there is way much more space allocated for cars, and not that many space allocated for people. Yeah. Right? And, and and it's people moving. It's not like vehicles move. No. But because of the size of the cars and the energy they need and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we need to allocate we need but we ended up allocating all this space to this what we agree inefficient mode of transportation. Yeah. And and it's just I would say people moving that uh, do not get that space back in return. So Marco, because I when I look at this video I also feel weirdly proud, like, whoa, we're doing so well. Hmm. Um, <laughs> is, 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 <laughs> do you agree? <laughs> is this like the ideal way of using the street? Well, like the, the traffic calming and every thought we just saw in the video? Uh, this is the rabbit hole where I'm currently very interested in. So uh, short answer, yes. We are doing much better than other places yeah. in terms of... Um, in terms of uh, adapting the, the the traffic engineering logic to also include uh, human quality. Yeah, that's, I think, sort of it. Yeah. But um, I also feel, so yes, and, and he's doing a great job. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fast, but I also feel that, what, what, am I living in a different country? Uh, because there, we just discussed there are 9 million cars here, mm -hmm. and it's increasing the amount of cars per inhabitant to 10 million soon. So we are passing, we are, we are passing uh, Germany on, on that scale, um, a, a car country. There are uh, about 40 to 60 severe crashes every day that make it into the newspaper. Probably there are more. There's two people being killed in traffic every day. Um, there is uh, 17 children, on average, per day involved in a traffic crash on their way to school. Yeah. 17. Yeah. Every day. Today, despite tomorrow, all the traffic calming. Despite all these this things. Um, so I think what we uh, did, and, and Talia Fakad, who I wrote a book with, called that a truce. We signed the truce. So in the 60s, we had the opportunity. I just have been discussing this. Yeah. We really had the opportunity, a very symbolic moment, where we could really challenge it and really develop just streets, as we call them, or fair streets, or fair public space. We, we, we were almost there. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, stopped the machine, and, and instead of, of going all or nothing, we went for the truce. And it's a very bloody truce. We are still suffering from that, but we do now have our own bicycle paths. We do now have traffic calming, uh, but still, um, the system in which our children go to school at the age of four, yeah. our kids at school uh, uh, get taught that the street is dangerous and they need to take... My son came at home at the age of four and told me, Daddy, I'm no longer allowed to take my ball to school because the street is too dangerous for that, they told me. So what, is hap what happened to yeah. you? So we've lost that, uh, that momentum. And so what I'm now fascinated by and we are also trying to study is, are we now even more stuck in the system than elsewhere. We see places like Wales, Barcelona, Paris, uh, Tokyo, everywhere, uh, real, real radical change happening. Uh, I don't see that in the Netherlands. I see that we are sort of, we don't realize. So we often get told like, you have, you have this Not Just Bikes channel, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can bike everywhere, what's the problem? Well, uh, do we really have just, is it just, is it fair? that we need to spend all the amount and energy that traffic engineers can uh, create to, to make our streets 
in such a way to prevent people from killing each other? Should we be really happy with 30 kilometers per hour, which means eight meters per second, which is from that side of the podium to there, in a street where children play? That's two parked cars. That's not, that's, that shouldn't be even the discussion. It's, so one of the things that I'm working on, and I will stop, mm -hmm. <laughs> Is, I, I, again, I think we're missing the point. We're trying to adapt our streets to uh, allocate a machine. Uh, why can you buy a machine in the Netherlands that can go 300 kilometers per hour? Why is a car subsidized, mm -hmm. Tesla, that can go from, one to, uh, to, from zero to 100 in 1.7 seconds? Uh, why are we not uh, addressing that danger and saying, okay, instead of adapting all our streets... And then who's we? Because you are addressing it, the we're discussing well, it today. Societies. But so why are we not uh, revolting and saying we need our streets back? Mm -hmm. Currently, our streets from from wall to wall are traffic engineering space, all to prevent people killing each other. So, and we know the technological technological solution exists. It's called intelligent speed assistance. Cars can already uh, uh, deal with that. We just do not want to introduce it. Cities are now scrambling to do it, and I hope that they will quickly do it. Mm -hmm. If you ever go to another city in Europe and you have this uh, shared or rental uh, e-scooter, step you, you go into a park, it's speed reduced. Everywhere. Why is that not possible with cars? Yeah. Why are they not speed reduced when, when they enter an area where children live? I, I, it's completely beyond me. And I think we are missing uh, anger uh, in society because we lost the symbolic power. It's yeah. apparently not, um, uh, it's, it's not tr tragic enough. Okay, let's... Uh look at the audience again, if anybody has any questions. Because we're only having like 15 Sorry, minutes funny. left and we have so much more to talk <laughs> yes. about. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the discussion. So I, I was uh, thinking of a couple of points related to the last bit of the discussion that Marco was also speaking on just now. Um, so, 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 so to me, one side of this whole uh, problem is also related to the market for cars being international. So there is, I mean, and, and also like, you know, political power, stru you know, structures in the international market. I mean, Netherlands is a small country, really small compared to the US, which is the worst example, the worst offender on this, uh, in this market and if they push big SUVs on the, on the Dutch market or elsewhere. Um, and, and, I, and I see an extended version of this in developing countries also. I, I grew up in a developing country, then I lived in the US for a long time also. And there also there is uh, big cars being pushed on the market. You see car sizes like going up, streets are not made for that sort of a, um, the, for that sort of a setup. So I'm just wondering how in that international world, like how do we, yeah you know, think of d domestic solutions. Yeah. yeah it's a well, very interesting point because I also thank you. I want to add that somebody on the, uh, on the chat also said that we're talking about our addiction. It's like Philip Morris telling the world that tobacco is our addiction. They're dishonest about their hard work to build and maintain their market. And you're also talking about how SUVs are being pushed into our market and also where you're from. Yeah. So w what's your reaction? Well, it's very good that you add this, the complexity to it. But at the same time, just to be the, uh, the contrarian here, uh, the country that you mentioned, I think also has, a, 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 um, has a, a, the freedom to uh, carry arms. That's not a very successful policy that we copy. Uh, we have a very different policy in the Netherlands, uh, e even if they're pushing us to do that differently. So I think it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, free us from the, uh, the responsibility that we have, and we, it's a good question also who we is, but let's say a city needs to protect its citizens. Uh, and, uh, and we do that in all kinds of ways. We also have emission zones, for instance. We just introduced them. And then uh, the, the world adapted around them and, and uh, it didn't fall to pieces. We've made ca streets car free because we decided so. Uh, and against all odds, the world didn't fall into pieces. So I don't, I, I, so, so maybe the domestic solution uh, by the way, it's a European law since last year that all cars need to have uh, intelligent speed assistance capability. So all, all cars in soon, all new cars will, will have that. Uh, let's try it out. Let's, try, let's be the first country that, that experiments. Let's be the first city where nobody dies anymore uh, because people are using machines that they cannot handle. Uh, I, I sometimes use the example of a coffee machine. Let's say that we invented a coffee machine here 
brilliant idea, uh, dripping water of, uh, on beans. Everybody wants it. Everybody has one in their house. We are all rich. And then uh, uh, there's only one problem, that the machine actually kills two people every day in the country, and people start maiming each other with the machine. How long can we uh, uh, have an acceptable standpoint to say, hey, we need to educate these people. Let's put them a helmet on them, because they are, cannot operate the machine. <laughs> the machine would be banned, right? Like the stint was banned because of one uh, crazy incident. But somehow, we, we all are able to ignore the elephant in the room and say, oh, no, it's... Oh, there's industry involved. It's too hard. I, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm way too angry. I'm way beyond that. Vanessa, <laughs> yeah. how angry are you? Like, is it... Yeah, I mean, I think I totally agree with Marco. I think, you know, when you look globally, actually, the United Nations General Assembly passed a motion to have the amount of road fatalities and injuries around the world by 2035, I think it is. Um, and, you know, and the reason is because we are losing, you know, um, basically, uh, I, I just want, yeah, half by 2030, yeah. Vision 50%. Yeah, and, you know, um, what uh, Marco is saying is happening around the world, right? We have 1.3 million deaths per year. It's the largest cause of death for someone between the age of 5 and 29 on the planet. It's like, you know, as you're saying, it's kind of like this thing that, like the ocean that the fish are swimming in the water, we kind of say, oh, well, but that's life, right? But it's been so constructed. And when we look at the United States or in Canada and the power of the car lobby, not just to push um, car ownership and private car ownership and the size of cars and the infrastructure for cars, but also um, to really, um, to take away options so where i grew up in where i grew up in vancouver you know tram systems were actually removed electric car opportunities were you know shut down so i think when we look at this i t completely agree with marco that we have to look at it as a society wide challenge this isn't about asking individuals to give up private car ownership when we've set up a whole society around this that it has a very um, deep um, power uh, implications behind it. And those are not just a uh, lot, like there's 724 or 40, 742 lobbyists in the United States, larger than Congress, just of the car lobby uh, pushing for this and going after the Inflation Reduction Act now as a main way of um, keeping the car industry going, the car dependency going. And that's happening a little bit at the less level at the, in the European level, but, and you see Europe trying to move away from private car ownership. Uh, you see car companies like Volvo wanting to become all electric vehicle by 2030. So you see some shifts taking place. But as Marco's saying, I think, you know, the key is how do we um, leapfrog? And I do think there's a role, not just of national governments, but also of cities. Yep. So yeah. One Earth Living, my nonprofit, works with C40 cities, this network of climate leader cities around the world. And we've also been looking at how they're creating these experiments at car-free zones yeah. and also reducing car advertisement. So there's some really interesting ways in which they're shifting the car culture even within their cities with the tools that they have. So I Thank think you. that's another key place. It's the tackling the advertising marketing and doing it not just in terms of billboards, et cetera, but in our media, you know, James Bond and the Aston Martin. Anybody who makes it in a movie or TV show has not only a great car, but a yacht and a private plane and a glass house on top of a hilltop. So we have to redefine what we are perceiving as the good life and how it shows up in our media which is often funded by car companies like the World's Fair was uh, in General Motors. Um, I think that because of the time, we're going to take a look in the audience. Anybody else? A question? Yeah, here in the front. <laughs> yes, I will be working length next week, uh, next year on a, at a company which uses a lot of the car models which the what our engineers uh, thought of. Do you think that in the future there will be a, a, a role for these models still? And if so, how would they change to include more a, a better city or better system? Yeah, so he's talking about the water management systems that were implicated, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you if you are happy to live in a sewage system, we should just continue with uh, building them. <laughs> Uh, because indeed, they're, they're under, so it's not so much the, the models 
that are wrong because all models are wrong. It is the underlying assumptions in the model that a street should serve for maximum throughput that, you, that we need to question. And all the money that is currently spent in the Netherlands, not depend, independent of what uh, party is in power, uh, the technocracy of traffic engineering uh, will use four-step uh, uh, transportation models that will always uh, make travel time savings trump, for instance, uh, safety investments. So if we do not challenge those uh, parameters that are, are standardized and, and solidified into our decision making, we will just keep continuing. Yeah. Uh, Change the parameters. Yeah. yeah, and I think, well, ideally, we are going to, uh, there's, there's a time and a need to develop a new uh, metaphors that we think work better. So why not uh, invite sociologists or, or other creative thinkers or artists even to think about, hey, what kind of new metaphors? Because uh, the discussion, it's, it's called box law. All models are wrong, however, some are useful. The usefulness of this model, uh, it was useful, I think, building the highway system, but it's not useful to think about the street in front of my house. Uh, and maybe, uh, if you ask me, we should get rid of the whole um, uh, re reductionism of the idea that there is one single model. And Groningen is now experimenting with that, with a new uh, ten-dimensional understanding of the street. So no longer can one model dominate. One, one short remark that I wanted to make on, on this, uh, yeah. also to, to make our thinking, I think, sharper. Um, it's, it's, it's actually pretty weird that somebody can say that we want 50% of the deaths. Yeah. Like in any other domain, that would be ridiculous. Uh, so that's not a goal. Uh, but um, there's, there's a, I think, a bigger problem because we have Vision Zero and uh, many countries are pursuing Vision Zero, zero deaths on a road. And the UK, for instance, is pretty far ahead in terms of uh, uh, having almost no children uh, currently being involved in traffic crashes, but that's because the children are no longer outside. Yeah. So, uh, so, this, the, so this is the mind trick, I think. It's, 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 I once, last year, it was a discussion about more elderly people on bikes uh, dying in single-sided crashes in the Netherlands. Uh, and it was all, okay, how can we re reduce that? And my standpoint was we should increase that. We should have more elderly people dying on bikes, many more. <laughs> uh, because el people die, all of you, Sorry, sorry to spoil the mood. <laughs> uh, especially old people, they, they tend to die, okay? They do it somewhere. Uh, what, what, is, what is a good sign of society is that they do it in public space. <laughs> the big problem that we want to tackle is we don't want to people to uh, uh, unintentionally kill each other. But that's a very different aspect. Then you should focus on other things. So vision zero should be vision zero, people unintentionally killing each other. Uh, but we should celebrate the fact that we are allowed to die. Uh, and maybe then somebody puts a powder bloom on us, uh, uh, as we've yeah. heard before. Yeah, Jaime. Um, yeah, I don't have particular remarks on that, but maybe I can come back with the previous point that uh, some person over there I cannot see very well made uh, about uh, what I also believe is that um, this is far beyond my field of expertise, mm -hmm. but I think that making the car more expensive or f for uh, not letting the car be kind of free uh, or reducing also car use and encouraging people to not use the car, making the end a lot of people angry. And I'm talking about like big people, like people playing uh, the political uh, game of the world, right? Yeah. I'm talking about company, oil companies, uh, yeah companies that build in highway infrastructure in developing countries that cannot afford by themselves. Like I'm from Chile and most of the highway infrastructure is not built by the countries, just a public-private partnership. And there are big companies tendering in order to get the millionaire and billionaire contracts to build highways in the cities or inter-regional uh, inter highways. So all these people, of course, they have an interest in, for, in promoting the car, right? Yeah. Because there are more cars, their business is doing better. And then they're happy, right? They're getting richer because it, it, this is more like a capitalistic way of, of, of looking at the world and all the issues that we're facing. So, yeah, to some extent, also uh, car companies are understanding maybe that this is happening regardless. So they are in also improving or uh, encouraging uh, electric mobility. Uh, we have the Teslas, but not only Tesla, but many uh, other uh, car, uh, car companies also having their uh, fancy and luxurious uh, electric vehicles uh, in, in offer. Um, yeah, and at some point, I also believe that this, this is a bit dangerous because it, it's kind of greenwashing the problem. In, this is my personal opinion. Electric but, vehicles are. Yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, they're, they're not 
locally polluting cities, right? Because they don't have an exhaust system, or they are they are not build, uh, they are not burning any fuel right there, right? But other than that, they're just cars. They're and, still and cars. Congestion yeah. is congestion with EVs and congestion without EVs. Yeah. Um, but and they're killing people. And I, I will say even that they can be even more dangerous sometimes because you cannot even uh, listen to them, right? I'm, sometimes I'm, I live in Delft, I'm walking with my wife, and sometimes we have like a big SUV right behind us and we never even uh, noticed that this car was behind yeah. us, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. This but you, you were saying we're going to, you know, s solve this problem re regardless, right? Like the cars, are, are we? Like, I, I are, can, can, we, can we cure the addiction in the end? I don't know. Well, well, building on that, I think that's part of the solution if we realize that, uh, and I think combining also your comment earlier that only if we challenge the rationality, and you said only if we change the, si the, pr the system purpose, like yeah. the goal of it. And uh, uh, I think there are many examples of cities doing that. Paris is a, a fine example. Okay, I'm going to try because... Okay. <laughs> okay, so this one, yeah. Um, Utrecht is a, is a beautiful example I see here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, but also, uh, again, we shouldn't um, uh, simplify car companies because I know that, for instance, at Volvo, they are thinking about... Uh, currently, their goal is they want to, to improve the world, greenwashing, mm -hmm. but the, the, the goal of the shareholders, that is, uh, by law, you need to follow um, uh, uh, profit-making, so the, the, the real goal of the company is to sell 10% more Volvos next year. Yeah. But the inter they're internally already discussing that's not attracting smart people to their company anymore because people do not care for that that much anymore. So if you want smart people attracted to your company, you need to start having internal debates. And the debate now is what if the goal of Volvo becomes how can we improve the well-being of a future generations with 10% every year? And that's a very interesting endeavor. Uh, and then you can use these companies and the power they hold uh, yeah. and the lobbies they do for a different purpose. Um, and another example on a smaller scale is uh, from Jan Gill, who, who taught me that uh, it's weird that all cities in the world have a, 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 a department of transport, but almost no city has a department of children. Um, and as soon as you do that, uh, people become, yes, people now become angry if we say car free, car low, car, yeah. weak, car, car, car. But uh, why are we not angry about the fact that 17 the children each day have a traumatic experience? And I think as soon as we start using other language, other narratives, mm -hmm. we will see that the, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of support of companies, of NGOs, is much bigger than we think. Yeah. And, and then uh, I think, and looking backwards in the 70s, there's reasons to believe that then tipping points can be quickly reached. And then yeah. we can do a lot, because we can. Vanessa, you also think the tipping point is at hand or not? Absolutely, because I think also we can look to some of the statistics that indicate in this direction, you know, there's been a reduction of young people getting driver's licenses globally. It's reducing by 1% a year. Of course, there are still many who want to drive that, you know, or need to drive. But there is that, there is a shift there culturally taking place. And I think it does have to do with what we place at the heart of the how we define the challenge. Because if we define the challenge as stopping the pollution of cars or some of the car problems, then I think we narrow the conversation. But when we ask the question, how do we create cities for people or even cities for children or cities for our most vulnerable, suddenly we, we will design in a different way. And, and then we can also think about not just, as Mark was saying earlier, not just about how we should... Um, support people moving large distances, but why are we moving at this at this yeah. uh, scale to begin with? So often when I talk to people about shifting transportation, the solution is moving away from private car, then the opportunity is shown as electric vehicles as number one, which personally I agree with you, is a, qu a big distraction from the other options, which is actually asking what if we moved in a different way, but also, why are we moving? And what has caused us to get to a place where we're doing these large distance travel? It doesn't mean we won't travel. We all want to see family. We want to visit places. But we've made certain amounts of movement just the norm. And we can start to ask, you know, perhaps we can do more, um, you know, for example, uh, more soft and inefficient ways of living. How do we start making things accessible in a certain area? Uh, how do we make longer distance travel enjoyable, but perhaps not as, as quick as it is right now? Yeah. 
And that has to do with shifting all sorts of cultures. It has to do with the expectations of work. It has to do with, so this is, I think, the biggest thing. Redefine the goal to cities for people. Make it a systems-wide, cities and rural areas for people, not just cities, but places for people. Thinking about it from a perspective of this is a cultural change, not just a technical one. And at the end of the day, you know, um, really looking for deeper solutions about you know, what brings us well-being as a, compared to just keeping the focus on shifting the car to be more efficient. Thank you for this beautiful summary. Before we go to the last uh, applause for our speakers today, I just, uh, <laughs> please, please hold, because I need to hold your attention. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of cool memes, but like no time for that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can check Twitter. It's you can it. check Marco's Twitter. It's full of it. So if you could scan the QR code and please let us know what do you think of our events, it would be really great. Thank you all for being here and participating. I please uh, give a warm last applause to our speakers of today, Marco, Vanessa, and Jaime. Thank you.